Thank you very much. Can you guys all hear me without me needing to use a microphone? Yes? OK, great. <laughs> OK, so Slamat Pagi Samwanya. Good morning. My name is Chinab, and I'm the CTO of Jubia, a startup based in Singapore. And we are one of the sponsors of this event. So being part and giving back to the community validates my love for technology, reinforcing what I do every day for my work. Python is, of course, the fuel of Jubia. We use it throughout our products, from our recommendations engine to OCR using PyTesseract and deep learning uh, to simple web-based applications as well. But the main reason we love Python so much is because of its simplicity, its high performance, and lastly, the community, the support which we have. Basically, all of you guys here today. So I see some smiling faces here today, and I'm hoping that this talk inspires you to learn more about DevOps, and we'll get started right away with it then. So a quick introduction to what we do at Jubilee. We make attending conferences and B2B exhibitions worth your time by personalizing your event experience through technology. Our flagship product is a one-to-one -one meeting system which is used by a lot of business conferences around the world. And we do this by intelligently matching people and content at events. So we found out there are two main reasons people attend events. The first is for contacts or lead generation at business conferences or B2B exhibitions, and also for learning and contributing to the content of the event. So at Jubilee, we unify the two together in our products, which is Match360 and the fully branded app. PyCon Malaysia is actually using our event app itself, and that's why we're the tech sponsors of this event. So if you guys haven't downloaded it, you can scan this QR code right now. It's a single QR code, not like the one you guys just saw. So this will bring you to your iOS or your Play Stores. OK, so without further ado, this is the topic which I'll be presenting today about, which is from zero to hero for managing your servers, or how you can use Python in the field of DevOps itself. So most of you guys will be familiar with Python for web-based applications or data enthusiasts. But Python and DevOps is still pretty new. And this is something which our company uses. And that's what we're going to be sharing about. So a quick show of hands. How many of you guys are from the field of DevOps? Oh, that's quite a number. Now, can you keep your hands up still? Sorry. OK, the ones who have not raised your hands, how many of you guys are developers who have to deal with your own infrastructure? OK, so that brings us to a majority of the people in this room, right? The ones who raised their hands, your infrastructure probably does not look like this. It starts off like this on day one, but then slowly over time, it gets more and more complex. <laughs> right? This is how Jubilee's infrastructure looks like right now, and I'm sure yours looks pretty much the same or even more complex. So at Jubilee, we have a series of microservices architecture divided into some columns. I'm not going to go to the details, but all you need to know is that it's very difficult to access and manage with a small team of developers. In Bahasa Malay, the word would be it's very pussing. <laughs> so how do we solve this problem? I simply Googled the term DevOps and came across this picture, which is all the tools there are in the field of DevOps. Being a team of only developers in Jubilee, it's pretty difficult to get started with one of these technologies because either they're too micro on a particular use case, or they are, there could be one technology which does everything, but it's too monolithic. And it's primarily meant for DevOps people, not generally developers. So we decided to use our Python skills to test and build something which solves our use case. And that's where I will be introducing to you guys our solution, which is the concept of a bastion and a satellite server. This is how it looks for the people who don't know. The middle server here is called the bastion server. 
and all your servers, which are your application servers, are over here, and we call them the satellite servers. So a quick definition of the terms here, because they may be new. Bastion server is something like a central server. It's like the midfielder in a game of soccer. It has access to your defenders. It, has, it can pass the ball to your strikers. The other servers, which is satellite, and by that we mean your application servers, which are far away from you. And that's why we call them the satellite servers. So the principle over here is when you access, as a developer, your servers, you're going via the Bastion server. And to set this up, it's pretty simple. You only need to have your SSH keys from the Bastion server moved over or pub put your public and private keys accordingly from your Bastion and your satellite. And what we did at Jubilee was create this Bastion server according to the use cases of our development team. And we did this in Python, and that's what I'll be sharing more about. So analogy to the Bastion server is that of a Swiss Army knife. I'm sure you all know about it. It's a very powerful knife which has multiple tools for different use cases. Similarly, I feel that the Bastion satellite server has several benefits. The first one is, of course, we standardize the access. I'm on a Mac, someone's on a Windows, Linux, someone wants to use FileZilla, someone wants to do FFTP. Everything gets standardized to go through your satellite, through your Bastion server. The next is about provisioning and deploying your code centrally from one place. This ties in together with how people in the DevOps field do CI and CD. Next, this concept actually improves your security because all accesses happen through a single point in your infrastructure, which is through your Bastion, and you can maximize your security's focus only on the Bastion itself and also between the connection between your Bastion and your satellite servers. And lastly, we feel it's very scalable because it has solved the problem of how we scale up our infrastructure with a small team of developers and vice versa. How do we manage a huge infrastructure with a forever growing team of developers as well? So we feel it's scalable. Now enough with the introduction, I'm just gonna jump right into the technical side of things. So the first concept you need to know is on the satellite server, we have come up with user groups, which is different access rights for your developers who are trying to access your applications. So in Jubilee, we came up with three. The first one is the Jedi or the legendary Yoda, who has super admin privileges to your whole system. He has pseudo, and that's enough said. The next is the master represented by Obi-Wan Kenobi. He is like your team leads, or maybe a DevOps person itself within your company. He has access to most of the commands, which you can do on a server, but limited to certain things which you just want to keep to your super ad. And finally, we have the apprentice here, represented by Luke Skywalker. So he, I mean, we all know the story, right? He grew from humble beginnings to becoming the strongest, one of the strongest people in the galaxy. He represents all the developers here all the people in this room today, who need the servers for development purposes, for checking the logs maybe, or whatever the use cases are in your company. So to continue with the Star Wars team over here, we created a group called the Resistance, which gives the satellite servers specific permissions which are only meant for the Jedi and the Master, which I'll be sharing more about later. On the Bastion server, you just need to know that it's just created just of three files. The first one is a command called walk, which is a wrapper around SSH. It calls a Python file, which gets the necessary parameters and calls SSH with those parameters. The second is the Python file itself, which is for us in our case called a proxy Python file. Now this file knows information about all your servers and it has access to your user groups as well. So it can determine which user should get access to which server. And finally, we do user management, where you can add all your developers inside there, manage which server they get access to and what kind of access. Is it the Jedi, Master, or Apprentice? 
So adding a server is very simple. When you add a server, you're simply adding the proxy file. And you can manage your servers via clusters, like all my Redis cluster servers in one maybe dictionary. Or in our case, we manage it by environments, like dev environment, production environment, and staging environment. And adding a user is also very straightforward. So of course, you have to add it to a, maybe a JSON file for managing which permissions the user has. And when a new developer joins, not only do you add it there, but you also add the user inside the Bastion server so that he can access your satellite servers. So a quick show of what's actually happening behind the scenes. This is our walk file. Now, it's a pseudo code. I'm, I think there's still some Python there. But you might notice that some variables come out from nowhere. So this is a bash file. Uh, you can see that we only take two parameters, which is the environment you want to access your server and the server itself. So in this case, our environment could be dev or prod. And your server could be whatever you name your servers inside your company for whatever purposes. For example, one of our products is called Sense, so we can access dev Sense. So what actually is doing is just this one line over here. It calls the SSH command and passes the parameters of the proxy command. The proxy command takes in the environment and the server. So quickly showing what we do in the proxy itself. The first thing we do in the proxy is define the server list, which I mentioned. So in this case, a dictionary of your environments. And within that is another nested dictionary of your servers itself. You can list your internal IPs and the ports of those servers there. And over here is the main logic, which determines what permissions to give based on a few things. The first is we, we find out who the user is logging in. So username.osgetlogin. And based on that, we find out what should the permissions of the user be. And we find the access levels. Now, if the access levels are not specified, maybe it could be a star. Star refers to everything. So we could get the permissions based on the star. And there's three permissions, like I already mentioned. So if it's apprentice, what's going to happen over here is, if I have my mouse, uh, we get the apprentice key. Now, this is a secret key which is stored in the server itself. So no developers have access to this. Now, this key will log in that developer as an apprentice to the satellite server. So if you guys remember, the SSH command is just simply SSH minus I, the key file, the user, which is going to be apprentice, at host, and then minus P, and then the port of the server, which was defined in my earlier slide. Very simple. right? And the same thing goes for master and Jedi level access as well. Now, of course, if someone's trying to break into your servers via this kind of setup, and you have more to, like, fortified your whole setup that people can only access through the Bastion server, then you could raise up warnings and this could be connected to your ELK systems, notify you, and so on. Yep. The next thing is how do you do your user management? For us, it's as simple as this. So there's two developers over here. Dev A, he has access to all the dev servers and he has Jedi level permission. And for prod, he has access to the API integration server. He has access to others as master. Similarly, there is another user with different kind of permissions. Of course, this is just an example. You would ten generally tend to give the lowest level of access to most of your people. So it would mostly show as apprentice. Yes. And I'm pretty sure you can also connect this to existing tools out there, like if you're already using Jira for your permissions management of your developers, or GitLab, which we do. We can connect this directly, so you don't have to insert it in two places. So this is connected with directly with who has access to your GitLab repositories, for example. And now time for a quick demo. So I will show you guys this in our production environment. I think it'll be easier if I mirror. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to enter inside my Bastion server. Oops, too small. Let's 
Sure, and hiding off. Can everyone take a look from the back? Okay. So I've entered my Bastion server. It's a simple any any kind of server. And over here are the files which I mentioned. So there is this is better. So we have the walk file, we have the user.json, and we have the proxy command file over here. So these are the three files we mentioned. Now there's of course other files as well which are dependent on our use case. And yeah, we can go, go through that if you guys want to later on. So what's important to note over here is that my user is Ubuntu. Everyone logs in with their own user. And Ubuntu itself would have some sort of permissions inside the user management file. So over here I have Jedi access to everything. Uh, I don't think it's very clear, but yeah, there's Jedi access, but other developers have different kinds of access depending on what are their requirements. So you can see here that some people have different levels of access to different kinds of servers. Now, when I want to access this, it is as simple as I specify walk, and we have limited pseudo access to walk only. So I specify my environment, which is dev, and I specify one of my servers, which is sense. And I'm inside my server. Now, of course, I don't expect to be doing this every day because I have to always go into one of my servers, the central server, and then write this command in. Too many steps. So another approach is uh, we can do it by creating aliases. So this is how we do it. So I'm inside my servers. What is actually happening is, uh, if you see JSSH over here, it is SSHing to my central. I'm passing the parameters as pseudo walk and then the argument, whatever I pass it after that. Similarly, another thing to note over here is we have the concept of mounting servers locally. So Long, long back, we were still using FileZilla, maybe three, four years back. And now we have totally removed that. Uh, we, we send files mostly through our CI system. But some people still prefer mounting it. For example, if we just want to check or change some files, and we can mount that locally. I hope this is fast. Yep, so I have my whole DevSense set up on my local. I can change whatever I want once I'm done. And if I have a hot, hot reload going on, I can unmount and everything's refreshed on the dev server. Right? You generally don't want to do this directly on your development environment, but if you have your own environment as a developer, you can do that very easily. So going back to DevSense, uh, right now I'm inside this DevSense folder uh, server. And if you notice, I came in with Ubuntu, but now I'm a Jedi. So when you access your satellite servers, you're restricted to just those three users we defined, and nothing more than that. And like, they have different kinds of accesses. So like one example is base over here. It has access only to the resistance group and the root user. So someone who's not part of the resistance, like apprentice, they can't go and change your code directly. Yeah, um, I think that should be it for the demo itself. So it's pretty straightforward. Now going back to the... What else can we accomplish with this structure which we have just shown you? Now this is some of the more exciting things. Uh, the first one is server configuration. Now one of the DevOps principles which we have learned uh, is servers should be treated as kettle, not pets. You know, generally for pets, you tend to take care of them, but for servers, you should not be taking care of them so much. You should not even be needing to SSH into them. But unfortunately, we still have to most of the times. And this concept allows you to manage everything via... So this concept allows you to manage everything via a central server. You don't have to necessarily go inside your 
satellite servers because you can send commands via your bastion to your satellite, you can get back the output, and you can manage everything from one place itself. You can have 100 servers behind you, but everything's accessed through that just one server. The next is code deployments, and this comes pretty naturally because you have a pipe built from your bastion server to your satellite servers. You can use this for fixing patches, you can use this for releasing code, for testing out things, and deployment becomes very easy and through one central place itself. This is a very big use case which we have in Jubilee. So now everyone who wants to go and manage their code, they do it all through the Bastion server, just through one file itself. You can even restrict access. So if some, one person has blocked your dev usage, meaning someone's using it right now, you can find out that because we're logging every usage. And if someone else tries to do it, it disallows you. And finally, the concept of a dev environment. So I hope some of you guys are already using like container services out there. This is something for those who do not. So if you have your own server, which is given to you by your company or your personal server, you can set up this Bastion server inside that server itself, and you can manage multiple repositories within that server. Sort of emulating what the container would do, and you can specify what ports you want to run your different repositories on, simulating like different accesses between your application servers. So let's take a look at the code for these, two th the, these three things which I just showed you guys. For the configuration part, I'm gonna show you an example of how you can create your server. So we use AWS. You can even connect this to AWS over here, where when you call the create server command, it uses bottle tree in Python, connects to EC2, spins it up, and after that, it checks for a certain things. Probably it does this permission check before it even goes to AWS. But anyways, the permission check over here ensures that if you're creating a production level server, it's done only by a Jedi. If it's a dev server, it could be created by a master as well. So if the permissions are not allowed, it will return over here. But assuming I'm a Jedi over here, I will continue on. We will install the requirements of that server. These are just app get installs. And then you can uh, link out like the Nginx port and the host, export the locales, disable the Nginx startup script. And the reason we do that is because we use supervisor for managing our servers. And finally, release the server itself. So this is where the main logic lies. And that's what I mean by the deployment of the code. So within release server, what we're actually doing is we are connecting to the list of repositories which is maintained within our company and we get the server itself which is specified previously we check again if the permissions are allowed to do it like a double check and then we have not I mean these are some of our specific use cases to our company to just make releasing much more easier so if you specify dev it's actually releasing the develop branch prod releases the master branch uh, you get your host string, and now, for example, for your dev environment, if you're maintaining your configs within your repository for dev environment, it removes off the prod configs. You can have server-specific logic, so this is interesting, where, for example, three of our servers don't use Celery, so we can go and remove the Celery if it is one of them. Now, this can be a lot smarter as well because it can be reading from your requirements list, your pip requirements list, and you don't have to write these such if cases. And lastly, it will execute the deploy repo script, which connects to your repository, pulls the code, and spins up the new instance or the new service which is supposed to run. Finally, we're just reading if everything's working fine. So what does deploy repo do? Within deploy repo, the first thing we do is we stop the supervisor CTL program. With, with the, with, within the directory of the code, we read the git ssh file, which is used to pull the repo from the repository to whatever you're using. It later on will put that under a ssh agent and git clone your repository itself. 
After that, we do some things like do some symbolic links because all the supervisor, nginx, uwsg config for us in our use case lies in the repo so we can link them out easily. And we set the right permissions required for this followed by some more package installments. Over here, we're doing uh, like installing our models packages using pip3. We set the resistance permissions like the one I showed you guys earlier. And over here, this is something new which we recently did. So we, we moved some of our secret variables from uh, Amazon SSM to our own repository, uh, which is a protected repository. And these variables come as environment file. So this is something nice. So what, what, what we do is these secret variables are stored in the Bastion server itself. The put command would replicate this to your satellite server. And we use sudo for it and we use the mirror local mode, which ensures that whatever permissions you have set on the Bastion server will be copied over to your satellite. So this way, all our permissions are sent over and no one has access to it because it uses sudo. So no one will have access to these variables either locally on the bastion or on the satellite as well. And next, we reread supervisor, assuming there are some supervisor changes. We restart the supervisor itself and restart the CTL, supervisor CTL as well. Quick demo again. So when we release, we release, so let me just show you guys from the start. I'm SSHing to central, which is my bastion server. And I will issue the release command for one of our servers, again, sent dev. So when I issue this, we'll just quickly go through this. What's actually happening is it's establishing the connection. It stops supervisor. It maintains the keys to the repo. It pulls the code from the repo, which is what it's doing now. We have some sub repositories as well. So like for example, extensions, which it just pulled. It installed my models. And finally, yeah, it's still installing the models. It sets the permissions over here. It checks there's no supervisor changes. It restarts supervisor and gives me the final output. So everything is done just with the click of a button. Just quickly going through what it did so that everyone knows because it went by too fast. So the first thing it did was stop supervisor itself. So we are running Nginx app celery. App is re referring to the Ubisky, uh instance itself. It stopped. It removed the root folder where the code lies. It set the permissions for the SSH key on the Bastion server. And this is being used now in the SSH agent. It's being passed here. None of the keys are being revealed to the developer. Just take note. And we issue a clone command from the Bastion to the satellite. And we specify where it should clone it because if you remember, I had a width and then the part of the folder where it should clone it in the satellite. It does the cloning, and then after that, we remove the prod config because it's a development server. We link out the Nginx symlinks out, and we set the permissions for any key files which lie within our repository itself. We install the models. And finally, after installing the models, we are done over here. We set the permissions for the resistance group, which ensures that no one can be tampering with your satellite. And we reread supervisor. It says there is no config updates to process. It restarts supervisor, it restarts everything, and it ensures that everything's running. So just a quick check if everything is actually running. Yeah, everything's still running. So yes, 
this is our DevSense application itself, and everything's still good to go. OK, so we are done with the demo, and I'm actually almost at the end now. So this concept over here uh, is actually a very integral part to the Jubilee DevOps environment. Like I mentioned, we don't have any DevOps engineers in our company itself. But now every developer is now empowered to use or use any concept of DevOps through this arrangement itself. They have the flexibility to go modify the Python scripts based on their use cases and spin up their own bastion servers so that they can access their own development environment. Some of you might be asking, why don't we just use containers for it? Because sometimes if you're running like multiple containers within your laptop itself, everything gets super slow. So we just spin up a big server on AWS for each developer who can just use it that way. And the best part is it's all in the background. So it's all happening without anyone taking note of it. So we are ensuring that it's scalable and it's secure as well. I hope this talk showed you guys that Python can be used for everyone and everything. Because we are always in this mentality that, oh no, I have to use R or Python for data, for example. But this shows us that DevOps actually has a big scope as well for Python. We, we do use it for a lot of applications. I mean, practically everything on Jubia is built with Python. But this is just one very small use case of how DevOps comes in handy with Python. Some of the more exciting things over in Jubilee, which we use Python for, is uh, for a TensorFlow-based model, where we build an interactive floor plan for an event. And we use uh, OCR libraries from Python for identifying where should the user be, where should a real attendee be walking, and detecting the booth information from big exhibition floor plans. The other thing is we use it for recommendation systems as well, like something what the keynote speaker described, how we use content-based filtering and collaborative-based filtering for recommendations of content and people at events. So we love Python, but I hope you guys are inspired to use it for DevOps as well. Next is the concept of backup and disaster recovery. So as a company, we work with a lot of enterprises, and they always come to us like, are you guys secure, if something happens to you, can you bring it up fast enough? I mean, we all know that AWS Tokyo was down yesterday, right? For, it was level one critical vulnerability. So using this, you can theoretically spin this up on any uh, cloud provider out there or any availability zone. Because it's all with the click of a button, you can spin up your whole infrastructure. And you can link this up with, in AWS I know it's cloud formation, so everything gets spun up directly. And lastly, I want to just mention that there is no one size fits all. So this worked really well for us, but I'm sure there's many different use cases out there in your company which may not fit this. So the idea of sharing this was a general framework or a library which you guys can tailor according to the needs of your company. I mean, for example, for us, three, three, use, three permissions is enough. But maybe if you guys are in a much bigger organization, three does not even make sense. So you can, of course, tailor it according to the requirements of your company. And with that, I come to the end of my presentation. So thank you all for listening in.